Hey everybody, um, welcome to Say It Loud. Uh, you're here at the Gallatin. You're about to hear some really dope art for some really dope people, for some really dope young people. Um, make sure you show your support by, you know, waving and clapping and snapping. Hey, yo, whatever you gotta do. Um, first up to the stage, I would like everyone to make some noise for Natalie Cook. That was good, that's perfect. In the overture to Earth, Darkness sang a revolution song that brought life to life. The sun stood from his seat in heaven as trees lifted like brown arms, raising their fists with pride. Some men began to transpose the revolution song. In their version, they likened their pigment to the moon, placing themselves on thrones tall as the sky. They segregated day and night, splitting life into two parts, black or white light or darkness. The men called their skin fair, deeming my body an injustice. Truth was converted into white man's theory. Darkness raised the sun like he was her own until night became the colored's only section. The men roasted a crucifix in the sun's fire and waited till she fell asleep to burn her resting place. The stars are night stripes. I wish upon a scar for the moon men to fall from grace, but they only continue to float higher. I was enslaved to be the moon shadow, only to be seen where walls are built. My silence is a preserved echo that bounces like a distorted reflection. The revolution song has been drowned out by white noise. Their rendering has scattered the earth like millions of seeds. The men turned my shadow into a character and inserted me into their cover of the revolution. They named me Jezebel, the black bitch. My skin, their target practice. My body, a breeding camp. The revolution song has been adapted and rewritten so that the world won't know that I have a voice. Who said that darkness can't be bright? Black is the source of light. My skin is so divine that even my wounds glow. They forgot that I am the ink that black is the world's native tongue. Try to genocide me, and you're left with a blank page posing as the moon. This is the part in the song where the men convince themselves that hate is truth, that they are God and I am not even human. Beware of false prophets who write worship songs. Before their beginning, darkness lit the galaxy. Everything divided is what was designed to be whole. History is propaganda. Diversity is an advertisement. Buy into the words and you'll actually start to believe that day and night is not a continuum. That light is a sign of privilege, which darkness can only access through a back door. Thank you. That's powerful. You guys are doing really great so far. Really great so far. Um, next, coming up to the stage, we have the lovely Hannah D. Williams. So please give it up for Hannah D. Williams. Yeah, okay, I could do a little. Okay, come on. Y'all was on the roll like five seconds ago. Thank you. There we go. Hi, I'm Hannah Daniel Williams, and I'm reading a piece that um, I'm really happy to say is um, published in a literary magazine Dinner with Billy. He could barely grip the doorknob as he staggered into the house. It took a few minutes for his eyes to adjust to the dark. The smell of Jack Daniels escaped from his mouth in between hiccups, like puffs of cigarette smoke. His mind, mired in his own darkness, tried to recall what his friend had laid out as the plan earlier that day. Go down the hall, check the pantry, behind the canned foods. Money should be there. You sure about this? Damn sure, money's there. The narrow hallway opened up into a larger room, the kitchen. The large window above the sink let in some moonlight. He spotted the alcove in the corner of the room, which he took to be the pantry. The cans clinked against each other as he felt behind them for any hint of a stash of money. Grab and go is what he was thinking, what he cared about. He squinted into the black abyss, panting, reaching inside, lurking into the unknown, wondering if the money was there. A cold rod pressed against his calf. Boom, like an explosion. 
I honestly don't even know how I reacted so quickly, being drunk and all. But I grabbed that shotgun and then I reached into my waistband and grabbed my own gun and just shot into the darkness. Billy sucked in air as though it had happened all just now. My dad had invited Billy Moore to have dinner with us the night before he was going to give a guest lecture to my dad's criminal law class. Billy reached for his glass of water and took a sip. I heard something thump on the floor, Billy continued. And when I turned on the light, there he lay. There was no blood that I could see. He was just lying still. I sat there, listening, as still as this dead man in the story. On July 17, 1974, the judge accepted Billy's guilty plea for felony murder and armed robbery in the first degree. His execution was set for Friday the 13th, September 13th. I heard Billy say that that was one of his many scheduled execution dates. I heard Billy say that at one point he was seven hours away from his execution. I was 11, too young to fathom what that must be like. Hey, Billy, one of the guards yelled out. Let's go on a field trip. Billy shook his head. I'd rather not. The guard made a whatever face and went back to taking notes in his large green notebook. The smell of urine burned Billy's nostrils something he still hadn't gotten used to after all these years. The metal toilet on the right side of the cell, just about 16 inches from the head of his cot, purred with the occasional jolt when another inmate flushed. The new jumpsuit they had him change into was itchy, especially where he was shaved, down on his calf. His Bible and other belongings were put into a box and stashed somewhere. His boots were stripped of their laces. Suicide isn't allowed. You can't cheat the state out of killing you by taking your own life. Nope, we're going, said the chunky officer. He hoisted himself up while emitting an exhaustive grunt. The skinny guard rose as if the wind had pushed him up. It reminded Billy of the birthday streamers he had hung for his son's third birthday, the year he lost his freedom, which emotionlessly fluttered from the doorframe. Against protocol, they led Billy down the hall to a part of the prison he had never seen before. The door banged behind them as they entered a blinding white room with a long horizontal window on the far wall. Something cloaked in a discolored sheet stood in the center and one of the officers let go of Billy's arm to approach it. Take a good look, he said, as he pulled the sheet away, like they do on game shows, revealing the chair that Billy would be sitting in at the moment of his death. And it was at that point that I caved Billy said. He rubbed his cheeks and shook his head. My mom told me to eat more of my dinner. Billy smiled. I think he knew it was hard to eat a meal and listen to this kind of thing. There was this moment at that dinner that sticks with me still, all these years later. I remember the way he bowed his head when he remarked that he was just a black man caught up in the criminal justice system. It's the word just that is significant here. His use of that one word, just, spoke to how he saw himself, that he didn't deserve a fair trial, that he wasn't worthy of an effective lawyer like rich white folks get, that he was destined for the chair when he entered the house and when the gun went boom. What Billy was really talking about is what it's like to be black in America. The death penalty is not just a form of punishment. This so-called machinery of death, which hides behind the rhetoric of justice and law and order, is a deceptive and malicious construct which carries its own semiotic power. The insidious nature of how it defines blackness in the United States brings to light the dark underbelly of America's ongoing racialized history. This process of identity formation lies at the very core of the current Black Lives Matter movement. When Billy said that he was just a black man, what he was really saying was that there was no point in getting on the witness stand and explaining that the killing was an accident. To be just a black man, Billy was saying, was to understand him as unworthy of being heard and powerless over his fate. That, to me, is the most significant meaning behind capital punishment. It's for you, the pop belly guard said while waving the envelope. Billy heard it scratch the ground as it skidded under the metal bars which separated him from his execution. He looked at it for a bit, not out of contemplation or wonder, but at first out of curiosity, and then with melancholy. He figured this would be the last time he would be in contact with the outside world, perhaps the last thing he would ever read. He bent over to pick up the white envelope. He stared at it. You gonna open it? Asked the guard. Ain't much time left. Billy said nothing. He was entranced by the jarring whiteness of the envelope, 
this whiteness in this dark place. He stood ramrod stiff, tall, motionless. This envelope was his last glimpse of light before infinite consuming darkness. All that Bible reading and still the intuition hits hard that there is nothing awaiting us on the other side because there is no other side. There's only this, the moment we are in. It was enough to make his knees buckle. Don't keep me hanging, said the guard with a stupid grin. He winked from the wittiness of his pun. Getting mail on death watch, that's a new one. Billy sat down on the edge of the bed and held the envelope gently, with care, like how he used to hold his infant son and gaze down at his little eyelids, which were closed as he slept. He read the words slowly. My son is not my son, he whispered, as if this was his last breath escaping his mouth. At this moment, in a sudden flash, he felt himself already dead. The shudder of the toilet awakened him from his dreamlike stupor, and, and sound began to faintly pour back into his ears. He rubbed his itchy calf. The smoothest of his hairless skin soothed him as his mind returned to the present. He could hear the hushed exchange between the two guards and the muffled clanging of angry cell doors opening and closing. He focused on the metronomic tempos of the dripping faucet and the ticking clock. Then he rose up and walked over to the bars. The paper rustled in the tight grip of his shaking hand. He looked down at the paper one last time, its wrinkled whiteness again pulling him into a trance. And then his whole world sank into the womb-like darkness. Thank you. Yes, give it up one more time, one more time, Fanny D. Williams. You all can have a seat. Look at Monique doing the Vanna White move with the, the Vanna White arm. Everyone, please, find your seat, find your seat, please, find your seat. We'll wait for everybody to get seated before we introduce the next act. How's everybody feeling? Is everybody else dead, or did I just... Did I miss that announcement? How's everybody feeling tonight? Is everyone okay? It's like, you can be like, yeah, we're good. You guys make noise. It's okay. It's okay. You know, it's beautiful people hearing some beautiful art. It's okay to like, you know, make some noise about it. And it's like 60 degrees outside, which means you should make more noise because we're in New York. Um, okay, so next to the stage, please give a round of applause and a very warm, heartfelt welcome to Latanya Blue. Hi everyone, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I think I have a few friends in the audience. I can't see y'all at all because the lights. And also, oh, there you are. Thank you to my mom for coming out as well. She's never heard my poetry before and she's never seen me you know, on stage like this before. So thank you to everyone for coming out. Um, a lot of what I write, or actually most of it, has to do with mental health and my journey to understanding more about myself in that way. So the poem that I'm gonna read tonight is called Nine. And it's basically the sights and the sounds and the smells and all of that of growing up in the Bronx, New York, which is where I'm from. When I was nine, walks to the park were caked in song. Horns blew for a language unlike mine. Trumpets fastening the belts on a hot summer mood. Stereo cages rang, calling attention to a ring of salt and pepper men. Puerto Rican poppies, I think they called it. They'd find a spot central to the park's amusement, losing their throats to a game of checkers and bets placed over dominoes. I trudged to the asphalt, dirt on my shoes, breathing in a hot park filled with smoke and broken Spanish. A precocious kid aware of my difference, I sat alone at the swing sets, too shy for the sprinklers, too oddly dressed. Coco, mango, cherry, the icy man would sing, and the red swings kicked my innocence with tangled chains. My defeats would collide in deafening tune, while I swung lower than the other kids, rich with youth's absence, and the wind refused to push me with them. Still fluffy in the cheeks, night would brew and I'd lie hidden beneath bed sheets, safe and brightened by night lamps. 
I exhaled an existence into the black between my hands, holding on to little skin and bones until the sun crawled through windows twice my size. When I was nine, it seemed happiness could run dry, like my eyes when I'd risk it all to taste the sun. But a fever still clung to the dust between my shoulder blades, squeezing life out my stiff neck, setting fire to limp hands that learned to fall and fall outside chalk lines. Thank you. Give it up one more time for Latanya. Thank you. Right, right. We'll let everybody have a seat. You guys are being awesome. Also, again, thank you for coming out tonight. You know, you could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with us. So give yourselves a round of applause if you want to do that too. It's awesome. Um, so a few words before the next piece and the next artist comes up. A lot has occurred from 1960 to 2017, much of which makes our historical evolution feel like decades on repeat. Although time seemingly flies by, it is essential to recognize the work that has been done socially and culturally to shape our future and also further their progress. Hannah's series questions the preservation of Afro-American history and culture, as well as the relationship between sound and time. Our senses can create or enhance imagery and or memories. The power of preservation must be recognized. We have the right to document our stories and the agency to imagine what our elders had the power to see. Without further ado, I introduce to you Hannah Morris. What is in your blueprint? This series is a commemoration of you and I, a reminder of the intricacies of our history, stripped, exploited, brutally oppressed, inherent trauma. You are fragile, you are tender, but you are still alive and you are blessed. And behind your deep soulful eyes is resilience. I look at you and I see power. I see love, it is within you, abundant and waiting. Waiting for you to accept your calling waiting for you to defy the odds, defy the systems, ignore the hate. You are wonderful and you are uniquely made. And all the tools you seek, they are inside and at your reach. I love you, queens and kings. You will always have a friend in me. Bless, thank you. Give it up one more time for Hannah Morris, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right on, right on, right on. Okay, so next to the stage, we have Nahal. Give it up for Nahal, please. Give it up, 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 give it up. Hi, uh, my name is Nahal. A little over a year ago, I was working on a story for Brooklyn Magazine about a group of men called the Bearded Dapper Gents who are working to increase positive representation of black men in America. Uh, the photos that you will see tonight are from an event where the Bearded Dapper Gents had asked uh, for men to join them in solidarity with black men who have been mistreated by the system. The photos are meant to pay homage to Ernest Withers and the men of the 1968 uh, Memphis sanitation strikes.
Give it a one more time for the Hall's photography. So many beautiful black men. This is nice. Um, sorry. <laughs> Can't take me anywhere. Um, oh, we're going to let this lovely lady have a seat. Don't worry. I didn't mean to call you out like that lady in the purple jacket. I didn't mean to put you on blast like that. Uh, <laughs> she's so nice. I love when people, excuse me, excuse me. I love it. Um, next to the stage, please give a very, very warm, heartfelt welcome to Karina Yard. Karina Yard.
it up one more time for Karina. Karina unfortunately cannot be here um, to hear your raucous applause, but we thank you all for her for so the love. Coming up next to the stage. Well, first of all, thank you guys again for making it. Um, we appreciate y'all. This is Say It Loud in case you came in late, in case you may have missed some of the dope stuff that happened in the first half. We got some more dope stuff for you in the second half, and we are kicking it off with the lovely Quanda Johnson. Give it up. What is it to love America? Sometimes to reach for the sacred ordinary, a home, a family, work, 
of faith, to seek out that nebulous, elusive, proverbial American dream, and trust America, love America, enough, more than enough, to strive for it, push for it, grab hold of it, a dream. I see a man hanging from an old pine wood tree on the edge of the fairgrounds, clothed to the baseball diamond. A festive area. The man riddled, devoured, swinging in the mid-autumn breeze. I don't know if death came by the hangman's noose, or if death came by bullet, or if death came from the pummeling his body took from the tens of men and women and children, taking turns beating, stoning, kicking, using their bodies to destroy his body. Who knows how death came? What I do know, death came on a Saturday. Saturday, October 21st, 1916, Abbeville County, South Carolina. By 3.30 p.m., my three times great paternal uncle, Anthony Crawford, has had his body cut down from that old pine. His corpse tossed onto the front porch of our patriarchal home. Legend has it, he was the wealthiest man in Abbeville County, black or white. Local estimates had his worth upwards, $25,000, home worth $20,000. They tolerated this for years. Owner of the most arable land in the county, estimates went from 427 to 600 acres. They tolerated this for years. White men having to buy a nigger's crops and seed, the son and grandson of slaves, deeded a modest plot upon his father's death, using his land to buy land, 1883, 1888, 1899, 1903, using his wealth to create wealth. They tolerated this for too many years, white men having to go to him to borrow money and having to pay him back. He wouldn't step off the sidewalk to let them pass, wouldn't step in the street to let their women pass. He tipped his hat back, ramrod straight, courteous, but he looked them in the eye when he spoke to them or when he was conducting business. Fourteen entitled nigger children, uppity, fancy nigger wife. They had put up with him and his a uh, black man reaching past the sacred ordinary. Well, you had to give it to him. The man had gall. Barksdale claimed the man wouldn't sell him any cotton seed. Said he sassed him. The day a white man hits me is the day I die. When the white man argued, he stood his ground. When the white man cursed him, he cursed back. When a white man hit him, he fought back. The day a white man hits me is the day I die. He knew, had made up his mind. He was going to die that day. They came by twos, by fives, by tens. Some say 400 strong. He fought them all, was arrested by Officer Botts, paid $15 bail to be released. If they're going to kill me, I'm going to die fighting. They're not going to drag me from the jail like I'm some rotten meat. While he took refuge in a cotton gin, a Mr. M.B. Can rushed him and got his skull fractured with a four-pound hammer for his trouble. The crowd frothing and foaming poured into the gin. The attack was ferocious, relentless. Someone threw a rock that knocked him out. Another got the courage to stab him in the back while he was lying face down. They left him for dead in the gin. Botts took him back to the jailhouse for his own protection. They came for him. The state said they had subdued the jailer at gunpoint, put a noose about my uncle's neck and like he was a slab of rotten meat, dragged him through the black section of Abbeville 
to the fairgrounds and that ancient pine. Maybe death came from the beating. Maybe he died when they hung him. By some accounts, they mutilated his body before they shot more than 200 rounds. I wonder why he died alone. Where were the other black bodies? His nine sons, his five daughters, his woman. The day a white man hits me, he died alone. Had his progeny been with him, this I know for certain, I would not be here now. Scattered, east, west, Evanston, Illinois, Brooklyn, New York, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, all along the eastern seaboard, land lost, wealth lost, the American dream lost, the depression Already migrants, already refugees, must build again another start. We, the Crawfords, the Johnsons, the Dials, the Smiths, the Evans, the Neelys, the Hazards, start again, another, another again, start again, another, searching for the sacred ordinary. And the old landmark, that silent witness, Oops. Drinking blood, does it still stand, that ancient pine? Was its thirst satisfied? <laughs> there are not enough tears to water this America. Oh, but the blood, if death is in the blood, then life is in the blood. Love is in the blood. <laughs> I love my people. And as a consequence, I love my country. It cost us great to be called American. <laughs> what does it mean to love America? America. This is your love letter. And like Saturn devouring his children, you have drank the blood of yours. And we love you still. Give it up one more time for Quanda Johnson. All right, so coming up next to the stage, give it up, please, please give it up for Donna Gary. Give it up. Her number in my phone, undialed, but always answered, Mama, the word in my mouth, wisdom tooth I can't pull, aching to say hello, to be taken out for a long call. When the phone rings, my mother's face, grapeseed oil shine, eggplant snoozing in and out of its October harvest, appears before me, her cheeks always the first to materialize, taut from the exercise of her own rocking laughter, round, plump, reservoir of teardrops, crystals deposited like pennies in a fountain, the only place I can get quality salt, makes this moment too irresistible to voicemail. I pick up my naked ache, the forgiving crestfallen daughter type, always settling on the phone into her voice, willing to take any piece of her I can get, like the hungry forgotten I am plunging into her. How you been, baby? I'm sorry, something came up after 
reserved seat empty all night after every graduation dinner at old country buffet yeah you can take this chair we don't need it her anymore we make plans she says it will be her treat. No more revolving door visits, free on her honor. Fair, I save up my two hour bus ride. She lays her whole schedule down for me. Assurance, a promise to lie on. My anticipation fogging up the glass to get a good look at us in her favorite restaurant, booth, love seat of nostalgia. Okay, Friday, see you then, love you, pause, love you too. Who am I when I am a daughter trying to fall in love with her mother for the first time? I am hope's rumble dislodging the warm roots of hesitation, mudslide of worry, I am early until she is late or never arriving, her plate clean and unburdened. I refuse to burden waiter with apologies after my mother hope teasing me with its small sharp teeth. My aunt says, you will get used to it. This is what I get, wanting proof otherwise, a memory that doesn't stand me up. I dine anyway. The aftertaste of her voice, my treat, love you gone sour. An almost daughter, rotting, post mudslide, annexing mama, done, saving the word, her, pulling my wisdom teeth out with no hands. This is me trying to unhome disappointment. Now a dark spot on my tongue, I let go of my uncle saying, you look just like her in mirrors. I find the hollow of her face, an echo of a mother in my hand when I cradle my own cheeks, steaming crimson in salt water at the bus stop, a reservoir, the shifty screen of which I watch, the only moment I can confidently say we share. My birth cascading down, down. Please give it a one more time for Donna Gray. So please keep that same, same enthusiasm and energy as we introduce to the stage, Natalie Doggett. Give it up, please, for Natalie Doggett. All I want for Christmas is a genealogy test. That Christmas, my parents told me I shouldn't expect much else under the tree. The vial for my spit came with a $100 fee, and the reparations were owed were still underway, as they still are. I said I didn't mind. I needed more than any other toy, closure, belonging, a soothing for my seventh grade family tree project on that Dollar Tree poster paper. My lineage materialized itself before me, circling itself from South Carolina to Virginia to New Jersey and back again, unable to find its way out to wherever it came from. My flesh and bone of this America, there is nothing more for it to go back to. But my blood is of the motherland that my flesh and bone have never been. All I want for Christmas is to be taken someplace beyond the southern plantation where my great great granddaddy was told by master he was a good boy. He turned those words over and over again until his tongue and teeth tired 
of them taken to the grave with him underneath his land. He never mentioned anything about no other motherland. My soul had dug a home of this land that they'll stay under their breath and even mine at all. It was never mine to begin with. But I say, for as long as the bare bodies of my great lie haphazardly beneath government buildings becoming one with American soil, here is where our hearts will stay. Yes, please can, can keep the applause going for Natalie Doggett, right? Yeah. Ah, you guys are good. You guys are good. You guys are good. Are we ready for more stuff? That's right on, right on, right on. Are you guys leaving? I'm calling y'all out too. Okay, y'all got rehearsal. Kill it, kill it. Do your thing. Do your thing. Do it. Ain't nothing but a chicken wing. Um, I'm way too old to be doing stuff like that. <sighs> so sad. <laughs> Coming up next to the stage, please give some love, show some love to the brother, a la Joseph. What's up, y'all? What's up, y'all? Yeah. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, my name's Ala Joseph. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Most High first. I want to give a shout out to all my friends and family that are here. And I want to give a shout out to all of the beautiful faces that I don't know that are here. Um, facts. Um, I'm going to be showing you guys a song that I wrote. Uh, and composed called Fightin'. Um, it's crazy how everything kind of happened. I, I wrote this song because uh, me and my brother were having a deep conversation about like family and stuff like that and our life experience. And it, I, and then I got invited to, to, to come and bless the stage. And so we here, you know. Um, drop the track. <laughs> Louder, I, we need this super loud. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We gotta keep fighting, fighting. in the air for me said no matter what happens yeah we gotta keep fighting fighting we gotta keep fighting fighting said we'll win in the end no matter what happens you gotta keep fighting fighting need help right now lights flashing in my eyes i can't figure it out 
mother's still working to survive I'm so stressed out I lost the best parts of my life Need help right now And don't you act so surprised Oh yeah No matter what happens, we gotta keep fighting. Hands up, we gotta keep fighting, fighting. No, we're winning in the end. No matter what happens, we gotta keep fighting, fighting. We gotta keep fighting, fighting. Said we'll win in the end. No matter what happens, we gotta keep fighting, fighting. We gotta keep fighting, fighting. Said we'll win in the end. No matter what happens, we gotta keep fighting, fighting. God. Yeah. God. Thank you. Give it up one more time for Allah Joseph. Keep on fighting. Keep on fighting. Please maintain that energy as we bring to the stage Shadina Savad. Give it up, please. Black man, black man, why you love everything but me? Anything lighter, you praise freely, but why you don't drink from my coffee? You know, being that we grew from the same tree, why have I been second guessing myself lately? Being that I've sacrificed for you so greatly. I have stretch marks on my belly. There are grays inside my hair. I have scars on my heart. I've lost hearing in one ear. I have spit my last on you. Yet you play me like a fool. We don't fuck with black girls, declared your whole crew. Meanwhile, I still think you're beautiful. Since we've been on that plantation, I've noticed I was losing you. You forgot to check for me because you were too busy pleasing Massa and Susie Q. Boy, I stay rooting for you. And when I say boy, it's only because I see God's son in you. But when they say boy, you say how high. Now on days to date a black man, I have to apply being that I'm probably fourth in line. But baby, how can you deny what God has placed on this earth to compliment you? I'm simply a reflection of you, so maybe it's not that simple. And maybe there's a lot of self-hate in you. Baby, maybe there's a small grave in you. I mean, have you died and lost your whole damn mind? Our people got but that much time, so how you got time to call me your bitch? Baby, you called me a nigga, and let's not forget, I'm not your nigga, dear nigga. House nigga, field nigga, still nigga, still nigga. Pardon me. You see, maybe I have to use the Jay-Z philosophy because my 99 problems isn't that you're not feeling me. The problem I have is to love her, you feel you must degrade me. Try to nickname me, but baby, I am still a Mona Lisa. And yes, my hair may not be as long or straight as Lisa's, but why do they get the finished product be while we put up with potential? And you know we're gonna ride or die, but why they ride, but we must die when we with you. And then you say it's my attitude? I got some news for you. I got a lot to be mad about. You left me stranded in this wilderness to raise your sons alone. Straight from my kingdom to a new home, then got the nerve to act like you ain't do shit wrong. And I get it. You're looking for any way out of our black world, but why out of your mouth do I hear, oh, you pretty for a dark-skinned girl? When you out here chasing anything lighter with my features. And I'm not here to call you out or play your teacher, but if I don't hold you accountable, then who will? If they see that you don't protect me, then who will? If you don't respect me, then who will? Listen, it's okay to date outside your race, but I won't have you turning up your face to the queens that birthed you. And I know America has hurt you, but baby, I'm on your team. So why are you being this mean like I put them heavy bags up on your back? 
You're not the only one that has to wake up every day and all black. It's hard for me too. Shit, I can't even tend to myself because I'm so worried about somebody killing you. You won't even bless me when I sneeze, yet my prayers are filled with you. And I know this epidemic is systematic, but you're participating in the same system killing the both of us because of your obsession to compete with Massa, because of your constant need for validation. King, when are you gonna learn, no matter how white your queen is, you cannot impress this nation? Don't you know this land was built off your back? So how can you shame me for my black king? I need you to explain that. Because you got these women out here thinking we bitter by nature. But did you explain that my pain comes in layers? Oh, I forgot, you can't. Because they just won't understand. They just don't get it. Only you and I know of this dance. Only you and I know what's really under the surface. Only you and I know the real effects of abandonment. I can't face this world on my own. I can't make this house a home. I can't claim this throne alone. Black man, black man, why you love everything but me? Anything lighter, you praise freely, but why you don't drink from my coffee, you know? being that we grew from the same damn tree. Please, please give it up for Jadina Savard, please. Do that, yeah, do that. Yeah, shout out your fam, that's what you're supposed to do. That's beautiful. So I'm gonna do some stuff if y'all don't mind. <laughs> don't, don't get too excited. Um, kind of rusty. <laughs> y'all can hear me, right? I'd rather die than let go of all of my dreams. One foot forward, all I gotta do is proceed. Trying to do something to better the life of my seed. I'm gonna make it, all I gotta do is believe. It's never too late to dream. It's never too late to dream. It's never too late to dream. There's a difference between being broke and being uncomfortable and living good and eating well just like a huxtable. Sticks, stones, break bones, but words hurt. So I'm Jackie Joyner Cursey jumping over a verse. Hurdle over bars gets worse. Disperse the bubble you sit in. Cross over J, get more righteous than Christians. Old soul, still see spirits stuck in a sit-in. I don't need a stool, just give me a star to sit in. Living testimony I'm giving you to the point of view of the few and the many in the pews. Looking for pools or sharks to prove that you don't need an ark to move that. Choose to chew the fat of the lamb. Land on a plan to stand on or at least build something your children can understand. I can't do can't because I remember my father's hands dried out and calloused because he was picking up cans. Me and my mama on Fordham and dollar vans. Well, y'all were busy watching the throne. Aunt Peggy called and told me that my dad's in a nursing home. So let's compare my problems to yours. Or oh, here's blah, 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 flapping the jaws. No backing, we rapping for four applause. Crossing our toes, these flows are open doors. In a session, focus, listen for punches. I used to get the ticket in line for the school lunches. We wasn't poor, but we had enough. Mama cried once she saw a ski in them handcuffs. I say a prayer for the ones that came before us. Feeling bigger than big when I'm on stage performing. I'll be watching y'all interviews, vain and porous. I'll be writing songs, two verses, a B chorus. Laughing at my tears, remembering when they ignored us. I'm a Capricorn, D and Ski are both the Taurus. So the pressure to be stubborn is so enormous. 
For my birthday, I bought my first pair of Jordans. Be happy I made it. There was times I couldn't afford it. People downloaded freedom. Freedom wasn't important. What really was important was the feeling that freedom offered. Lay me down to sleep, each bar covered in corpses. Pen has the magic we found in Markham's coffin. I could have been in juvie, stuck in Spofford. It's what separates rich visionaries from paupers. Raise your hand if you never knew your father. Living life like Linda T's only sun, only star, only moon. Yeah, the only one who was predestined to rise. So my future like waves dipping in tides. A lot of fake friends, fuck them, so let them dive. Then I met Tiff, found keys, told me to drive. Me and I, two cells, how about decide? Fried rice, fried scallops, and fries on the side. Mama, mama bleeding, bleeding when I arrive. Doctors looked at her stomach, told her think I should die. God told him, chill, nah, I think he fly. <laughs> so I made a wish up to the sky. Closed my eyes, said my prayers, and then I tried. You can do it too, no matter how's or the wise. We're talking about Egyptians building pyramid pies. We're talking about eclipse and giving eyes to the blind. Life, one big roller to die. Either get to living or just roll over die. Thank you, y'all. Um, so I'm, I'm working on my memoir, and um, there's some stuff. I'm going to try to make this quick. Uh, I, I write a lot about um, like race and politics and love, because that, those are the things that are most inherent in me. Um, and so yeah, this is called Trains. Part of me thinks I will never fall in love again because I keep falling in love with imaginary people that do not exist. I have fallen in love with women on the train, men who hold doors for the elderly, big-haired black women feeding partners grapes and sunflower seeds on picnic blankets. Tourists who spend too much of their converted traveler's check dollars on overpriced street cart halal food with tarot cart readers, with whole food grocery shoppers, people who give too much change to strangers. Women who lick their fingers after eating barbecue ribs. Men who pin roll pant legs to show off ankles or impressive socks with origami depictions of Rick and Morty sewn into them. <laughs> Women who clap in between words. Who let the spittle fly and linger and nag lifelike in the air like miniature semicolons run amok. Men who touch their partner's thigh when they are going to say something of the utmost importance or when they are about to lie or say something that will ensure it is the last time they will ever be able to share something as intimate as a hand to distress denim or Lululemon stretch material on top of their partner's body ever again. <laughs> I am falling in love with the ones with the misplaced septums and the unlearned crystals, the ones with the loose locks, the ones who snatch purses, the ones that don't text back, the ones you are too light for, the ones you are too dark for, the ones you are too soft for, the ones that only want a real nigga, the ones with daddy issues, the ones with broken homes as tattoos, the ones that name their children after dead grandfathers, after the names of liquor stores, after the names of freed slaves, wear their necklines like charm bracelets, who wear their scars like ornaments, like scarves, like prison sentences, like crocheted socks, like machete hands, like washed feet soiled from too much prayer. Before the invention of time machines and Amazon Echoes, before espresso pumps, before Caribbean mothers yelling the answers out loud to family feud questions to no one but themselves. <laughs> and perhaps the 12-year-old ghost that still plays kickball in the foyer between the kitchen, before crumpled seventh grade loose leaf love letter paper, before eggnog and gentrified Popeye's locations. Before Jesus and Showtime, kids flipping hats for quarters, before the throwing of stones, before the pulling off of hijabs, before shoes thrown at presidents, before the birthers, before the burning of a CVS, before Freddie Gray, before Chicago and Fred Hampton, before bed bugs and tiki torches, before snakes and apples, they were lovers. The lovers came, still come, 
in short form poems and pipe bombs. Lucid dream states and translucent passenger side views of Kang affiliations and flags being flown at low decibels where you can hear the heat of the sound, the flipping of a finger against a bandana mixed against the wind. There is an unfiltered, undocumented, ban the wall kind of thing love can do. A lover does, will do, will invite all of the dopamine, will make you walk desert and coals and go further than half to meet a non-existent middle, a non-existent that you will wish to be a parent, that you will wish to be. So please, meet lovers head on, head first. The one skilled with swallowing teeth into words, biting Basquiat strokes with the fingers or dick. The ones who brandish guns and fuck yous. The salty girls with ring pops, the dildos, middle finger and Polaroid abusers. The men with the gem stars, functioning Pyrex superstars, complex in the way they lift, tricep through street lights, cat call precision experts. I may have finger fucked, slept with them all in my head. The ones with heart pendants in the shapes of vaginas around their necks, introverts dangling their sleeves over their thumbs to stop the vomit, to keep the tremors in the lungs from reaching the night. So much so, you turn lovers into stories, their stories into poems, poems into bones, bones into brick and mortar store, into co-ops my mama can't afford, and there is no rent is too damn high, man, to save us from the collision of stocks and bitcoins and the falling that happens when she feels further than the climax. She keeps having without you. The high your daddy's ex-junkie girlfriend kept chasing. It's all clearer now. All this love falling in, all me falling for it. Fictional fallacies probing the high rises of the city. The fallacy of being a martyr for the fallers. Like that is a calling. It's a breakfast in bed or maybe a bed and breakfast. There is a bed and breakfast in Brooklyn I have been saving for eight years and have yet to use. And part of me wonders if that someone will be on the train, in the street, at a church, in a mosque, a homeless shelter, besides a stripper pole, in a morgue, by a car crash, wondering if she will be her. So. How you doing, ladies and gentlemen? Did you enjoy yourself? Did you have a good time? Excellent. We want to thank you for coming out tonight. We really appreciate the support. It's a labor of love to put this show together. All of these artists, you know, dug down deep. They wrote something. They created something uh, from a beautiful place. And we're very thankful that we have an opportunity to share all of that with you. So I'd like to bring everybody out, everybody who performed here tonight. Please come on out and join us. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you the cast of this year's Say It Loud. Please take a bow. Once again, thank you for coming out and supporting Gallatin's Black History Month series. No matter what you do or where you go, always remember to take some time and say it loud. Thank you. Please join us for a brief reception. <laughs>